technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job, to redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato and I'm your DARPA host. Today, I'm pleased to be talking with Dr. John Burke, a program manager since 2017 in the agency's Microsystems Technology Office. We are recording our conversations from our respective homes as we do our parts to slow the spread of COVID-19, the pandemic disease caused by the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. This is also why you might hear ambient sounds like trucks and sirens and birds. John brings his technology visions to DARPA on detail from the Air Force Research Laboratory Space Vehicles Directorate at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. There, he led a research team developing atomic clocks, atomic time transfer for synchronization applications, and ultra-precision measurement techniques for use in the global positioning system and other space applications. His research interests include the development of next-generation sensors for pushing the state-of-the-art in, for example, remote detection, and frequency synthesis methods to enable PNT capabilities. PNT is geek speak for positioning, navigation, and timing. John earned his PhD in physics from the University of Virginia. John, thanks for joining me. Well, glad to be here. Thanks for uh, inviting me to do this. Well, so I know that one of your interests at DARPA is to reduce the complexity, cost, and size of PNT and other techniques and to make these usable outside of laboratory settings. And we'll get to those when we speak about your programs. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit about where your interest in science comes from. If uh, you, your parents were scientists or if you had an amazing teacher, just what is it that turned you towards science? I think it really started in, in youth, as, I, as opposed it does for many people, just sort of a, a natural curiosity in the, the world. And uh, as I grew up and, and kind of discovered I was pretty good at math, I think every person either has a good or a bad experience with that. Uh, mine was positive, and one thing led to another, and uh, I went to college, and uh, a professor talked me into taking Physics 101 for a general education requirement, and I did really, really well. And one thing led to another, and here I am. And that's sort of how that, that went. I will say uh, one little thing. Along the way, it turned out that my uh, great-grandfather actually was a physics professor at the college that I went to. Now, I knew this a little bit going there, but uh, I didn't really discover this until I was there. And so it turns out that uh, my great-grandfather was a physicist named John, and here I am, his name, and doing the same thing, which always kind of is an amazing circle there. It's the Burke dynasty in physics, uh, so that, that, that's really a cool bit of history connected to, to the school you went to. So you worked at the Air Force Research Laboratory in Kirtland, and so my guess is that you knew about DARPA quite well even there, but how is it that you got to DARPA? Every program manager has a how I got to DARPA story, so what's yours? When I was in graduate school, uh, we were funded, I was funded as a graduate student by DARPA, and so that was my first exposure to it. The pressure was overwhelming to perform, but uh, it was, it was uh, really rewarding to have some direction to go in and not just sort of float in the endless world of questions you might ask in physics or in science in general. Uh, so that's kind of when I got interested in, in being par a participant in sort of the DARPA mission. You know, that, I think that stayed with me, and I went to Air Force, as you just said. And in DARPA, there are many folks in the government that uh, help DARPA with more context for the problems that they're being solved. And I helped in that role for quite a while before being asked to join the ranks, and I was very excited to do so. Okay, and just want to backtrack a little bit to that earlier, I think you said involvement as a graduate student, is that what you said? That's right. What was the program you were working on there? It was called the uh, Guided Bose-Einstein Condensate Interferometer Program, which is a mouthful to be sure. And, and what really what we're talking about are tiny, you know, sort of fundamental particles like atoms that are put into a certain condition so that they all are sort of like one macroscopic quantum object that you can manipulate. Is that, did I get that kind of right? That's pretty close to right. It is a, it's a strange thing. Uh, it turns out that uh, Einstein and a, and a physicist named Bose figured out that you could, under certain conditions, make basically they need to be very cold. If you can cool particles down to a certain temperature and put them in a box, they would Instead of behaving like individual particles banging into each other, they would act more like a super particle. They all kind of act together in a coherent fashion. The, the most normal uh, way of talking about this is 
the most common, I should say, way of talking about this is a comparison to the laser. You know, you have a light bulb, that you, you know how that works, and you have a laser pointer, and you, people have experience with those, you know, playing with their cat or, or whatever. So the, that's sort of the difference we're talking about here. Sort of normal particles in a gas, they bang into each other like billiard balls, and it's sort of one kind of physics. And then if you do this BEC uh, condensation, they act more like a laser. So it's a, a whole different set of rules applied. So that's, that was what we were exploring at the time. So John, now I want to segue into talking about your programs, two of which you inherited and two of which you are going to be rolling out or are rolling out. Let's go to the, the inherited programs first. One is called the Atomic Clocks with Enhanced Stabilities Program or ACES. And one is actually a much more multisyllabic program known for short as ambient, but in long form as Atomic Magnetometer for Biological Imaging in Earth's Native Terrain. So let's talk about both programs, starting with ACES. And, and so what's the technology goal of ACES and, and how would you uh, describe the status of the program? So ACES uh, is, is trying to make some of the world's best atomic clocks uh, add to a package that is actually usable. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, there's a long history actually at DARPA of trying to do this. It was a program called CSAC uh, quite a uh, maybe 15 years ago. Tried to do this. And that stands for? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's the chip scale atomic clock. So it's a little more self-evident what that's trying to do. That was really a, a successful program. And uh, you can buy CSACs, uh, these chip scale atomic clocks, and they're in a variety of, of different things. Just mention a few of the uses. Sure. So uh, I'll, I'll say atomic clocks in general, um, the, the main use for them is, is, well, synchronization, obviously. But what are they synchronizing? They're synchronizing things like GPS. GPS, the Global Positioning System, is entirely founded on these atomic clocks. Uh, if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't, it wouldn't work at all. Uh, there are also uh, backups uh, for a lot of information technology systems, so things like uh, finance markets, uh, uh, big data, data centers. Uh, all these things, when a lot of data is moving around, require synchronization. You find atomic clocks in all of those kinds of applications. Right. Okay. And unseen to most of us is just, just the role that atomic clocks play, as you say, in everything from GPS all the way to, to the financial transactions. But so getting back to ACE, the ACES program, uh, you know, again, what's the technology uh, goal and how would you describe the status of the program? So there's, there's a whole slew of atomic clocks that, uh, that are out there. Some, some are pretty expensive and you would not see those except in uh, very specialized circumstances. And some are very inexpensive like the chip scale atomic clock is, is relatively inexpensive. But the expensive ones, uh, things you find in like finance networks and in GPS systems, uh, the question was, could we make something as good as that, but at a size and cost and, and power low enough uh, that you could actually start thinking about putting them more places? And so that's the goal of the program, to try to make a, a, an atomic clock that you could still buy, but it would cost you, say, $100,000 uh, and fill up a a good chunk of, uh, of your real estate in, a, in say, a, a, del a telecommunications cabinet and uh, replace it with something that was more like the size of your fist or maybe even smaller than that. And then you could start putting them in radios, putting them in airplanes, putting them in uh, all, all, all matter of places. So that's the goal of the program. Uh, to, to do that, uh, is, it turns out every part of these best atomic clocks that you could buy has to be miniaturized pretty systematically and that won't be enough and we need to go to the laboratories where some of the best atomic clocks are made and learn some new techniques uh, laser cooling being one of them we were just, just previously talking a little bit about cool cold particles uh, and and try to implement those also to make those small so it's a pretty big systems challenge of lots of pieces being made small where are we at in the program? We're, we're actually towards the end of the program. And, uh, you know, I would I got to tell you, when I took over the program over, it seemed like a very, very difficult challenge. It was, I had, I had to be honest, I think it would be unlikely that we would, uh, uh, in a, the four-year program or so, we would succeed to the level we have. But lo and behold, it's, we're about uh, six months out to the end of the program, and we have prototypes, and they work. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, each little component in there is a little bit of a, of a dry story, but they're all kind of amazing when you think about them. Uh, vacuum pumps and, and uh, special lasers and just, just all kinds of little pieces that had to be made to fit in there, but they work. And, and uh, I think pretty soon we'll have ACES clocks that at least some people will be able to go buy. 
maybe you can just say a little bit about you know kind of what what this does mean when when you can miniaturize and make more affordable technologies that in the past have been too big um, or too expensive to use. I mean, I'm thinking of just even the way GPS became miniaturized and, and is now in all of our phones, something that DARPA also had a role in. So what happens when we can take, uh, you know, uh, atomic clocks and put them into uh, gadgets that they just uh, have not been able to go into before? Well, let's start with the GPS system, because that, that's probably the, the most important place to start. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people maybe not realize how important GPS actually is. It's in practically everything, right? It's the, what makes your mobile phones really work as well as they do. Uh, it, it makes our electrical system work as, as reliably as it does. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, even to the point of uh, right now, I don't know if you realize this, but the best farming equipment and actually most of our crops now are dependent on GPS. They actually record each one of the seeds exactly where it is to like a centimeter. And so they can go back to that seed. Right. So they can do precision farming, precision fertilizer application, precision application of water where needed. Yeah. Amazing. It's amazing. And so GPS is everywhere. But what you might not realize is that if something were to happen to GPS, you know, it could be a, a man-made problem. Uh, there have been several instances of that, just, you know, uh, bugs basically in the system that have been discovered uh, to a, a natural system, a problem. Uh, if some, some way of, uh, you know, like a solar flare has been uh, famously talked about. It's being very disruptive. And so what would happen if we didn't have GPS was all those things that depend on it would all of a sudden be floating and uh, not have that timing or that location information. And it would be very bad. I mean, so Uber, for example, how would Uber work, uh, your ride sharing work, if there was no GPS for a day? I mean, it wouldn't work at all. It's an important problem. So the main thing, the absolute main thing that ACES will do is that by affordably making a clock of this quality, those kinds of systems, or at least those that choose, can put ACES clocks as backups in their in their systems. You know, we're planning for a, maybe a bad day someday, but that day would be a little less bad now if we could have some reasonably priced clocks in those systems. Right. And just because we are talking about DARPA here, which is part of the Department of Defense, I mean, we should point out that, of course, one of the concerns and a driving concern is really if GPS becomes unavailable uh, to the military services and the assets that we have that depend on them, right? So this is this is one of the drivers for trying to come up with alternatives to GPS that can kick in there if, in fact, um, an adversary or some other reason the GPS system becomes unavailable. That's right. We're going to use ACES clocks there first, of course. But if we can manage that, then I think you'll see them in, in commercial use all over the place, too. Uh, I'll say one of the most important places you might see this, you know, is a, in our cellular infrastructure. So there's a reason all of our phones, if you actually compare a phone with somebody, they all agree on what time it is. And it's all tied back to GPS through your cell phone tower. So that's the same thing. If we can make it cheap enough that the telecom companies won't, you know, balk at putting a, a really nice timekeeping unit in their base stations and the towers and so on, now all of a sudden you have a, a much more robust uh, telecommunication system in case uh, something happens. But also they can make this, the systems even better, right? There's a There's a real chance that you know, uh, past 5G, 6G, whatever is out past that might utilize the timing that these clocks uh, give the systems more so. So, you know, really have uh, telecommunications companies sort of, I, I would say, like lean into the timing precision they could they could buy at a reasonable price. It, it could be a really big game changer. That's because it, it would help them piece together many more packets of information coming in at all different times, right? Because they can timestamp those so accurately. That's right. You can timestamp them very accurately. And it's really important for things like data handoff, especially if you're driving around. It's actually kind of amazing when you think about it. You You can drive in your car now. And for the most part, your call doesn't drop. Right. You can go through a tunnel, you can go under a bridge, no problem. And you have to ask, why is that? And well, it's because it, those data packets are being routed between, between different towers all the time, and it works seamlessly. So it's a powerful technique to synchronize and, and just coordinate different data activities. Now let's move to the second program that you inherited, and this was from a former program manager, Robert Lutwak. Uh, this one is called Atomic Magnetometer for Biological Imaging in Earth's Native Terrain, or Ambient for short. That's two I's in there. What's that program about and where is it heading? So Ambient is, a, is a, like I said, it's a, it's a magnetometer program. And uh, so first questions to ask is, well, what is a ma magnetometer? Uh, and it's simply a device that, can, that measures magnetic fields. 
And you might ask why would we want to ever have such a device, but it turns out that uh, lots of things have a magnetic uh, moment to them, or uh, like a permanent magnet does, uh, even if it's not a strong one, and that can be used to find them. So you see this all the time. So for example, uh, you see people using uh, uh, metal detectors to find like jewelry on a beach. That's a classic example of, of someone using some of the magnetic properties of the device, uh, of the sorry, of the uh, object they're trying to find to find it, even though it'd be difficult otherwise. Although usually they're finding bottle caps. That's right. And so uh, you highlight an important problem in magnetometers just already. So the magnetic field made by the object can be actually large enough, pretty easily to find. The problem is there's so many things that have a magnetic, uh, associated magnetic field that they kind of clutter each other up. And so it can be very easy to get lost in all the noise made by all those objects. Not to mention the earth has a magnetic field that's actually quite large in the scale of any of these things we're talking about. So you have to subtract that off. And so that's, you hear that in the program in earth's native terrain. So, the problem we're trying to solve here is how can one make a magnetometer that sort of automatically or intrinsically removes that background field and can separate out all the clutter uh, that you from different objects so you could really hone in on one thing that you cared about. One of the potential applications that has caught my attention is in using these new kinds of magnetometers as, as measurement instruments for the brain to, to sort of look at the magnetic fields that are associated with all of the kind of movement of electrical charges in the brain. What, what can you say about that? So that's right. So the, the, it's not just permanent objects, like you say, it's anything that makes a current uh, so that your brain does that. You, you have neural circuits in your brain that are constantly firing, trying to sort out the, the world around you. And uh, those currents make magnetic fields, and the magnetic fields can be detected. They pass right through the skull and to the outside world. Now, as you might imagine, those currents are really, really small. So actually detecting the magnetic field associated with them is, is pretty challenging, especially if you've got this big earth field trying to wash all of that out. The ambient program, that's one of the first things we're trying to do, because it's just a really hard problem. It's a very small magnetic field. I'll give you a number. It's a on the scale of about 10 femtotesla. Femto, so that's small. That's 10 to the minus 15 of something. 10 to the minus 15 of something. And to put that in perspective, that is uh, about, uh, so uh, Earth's magnetic field is about 100 microtesla. So we've got about, uh, uh, let's see, what is the math? That's about 12 orders of magnitude we've got to, to cut through uh, in order to see this. That is a really, really hard problem. How do you measure something small in the face of something large? So we, we're trying to, like I said, measure these uh, tiny magnetic fields. And the, the way we're going to do that is instead of measuring the magnetic field itself, we'll try to measure the gradient of the magnetic field. So instead of measuring the raw field, you're actually measuring the difference between two magnetometers directly. So the idea is you put one magnetometer maybe next to your brain, just outside your, your skull, and the other magnetometer is a, little, a, you know, a few inches away from that, which doesn't sound like a lot but uh, in distance, but it's enough to sort of measure the separation between what your brain's doing and what the Earth is doing and subtract those two and give you back a signal that's hopefully just what your brain is doing. I remember talking to Robert Lutwak about some of the potential biomedical applications here, like potentially helping to monitor what is happening in the nervous system during medical procedures, you know, whether that's some kind of neurosurgery, or I think uh, you and I, in an earlier discussion, you mentioned uh, concussion monitoring. That's right. You know, the brain is sort of famously difficult to understand and, and uh, make any kind of reasonable measurements of, especially in real time. You know, we have uh, CAT scans and things like this. Uh, but if you want to know something about an injury happening to the brain in real time, uh, that's very difficult to find. So that's the kind of thing we might try to go use this for is real time concussion monitoring. You can actually maybe be able to see um, if the neural activity in your brain has changed from what it was the day before. So a football player might have a, a very fast ability to uh, see if they've been concussed. And if we make it small and portable, then they could do it out, you know, on the side of the field with the Earth's field constantly trying to wash it out, that, that would be 
I think one of the primary ways we'd, we want to do this. In the military, we want to do this too for, for say, soldiers that are exposed to a, an explosion of some kind. It's essentially the same problem. How do you know if that soldier's okay to keep continue? Just in a more general sense, and just bring me briefly on this, I mean, it, it pushes science forward whenever uh, you can uh, develop a, a sensor that just is more capable. It's more sensitive or it's more accurate or it's tapping into a signal out there in the world that the other sensors have not been able to do you open up uh, opportunities for more discovery, right? And so I would think these kinds of uh, magnetometers coming out of Ambien might also serve that purpose. That's right. I mean, it's, it's a tool not just to explore magnetic fields or some particular problem like uh, concussions, uh, but it's a, it's a means to see our world uh, with a different sort of ability than we had before. Uh, I think that's the really fascinating thing. So we we, we have a particular problem in our, in, that we're looking at, but the the larger picture of of how can you understand the world around a, us, and anytime we can expand our capability to do that, scientists everywhere and all kinds of applications, engineers and so on will find a way to make the best of that and discover new things and make new new types of uh, applications and capabilities. So that's really the really exciting part is figuring out how to tap into that um, that inherent accuracy and, and, and sensitivity these these kind of sensors can uh, can give us. So we've spoken about two, the two programs that you inherited, ACES and Ambient, but you are in the process of rolling out two other programs. Sure. So the, uh, the first program I'll just briefly mention is the Atomic Photonic Integration Program. Basically, the problem is for these really high-end uh, quantum sensors that, that exist in laboratories, if you look at these things in someone's laboratory at a university, say, uh, you'll instantly see this large forest of optics and mirrors and lasers and just all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it's amazing what scientists can do with all of that, but it takes you know a small army of graduate students to run all of that and assemble it and, and a lot of, of funding and money. Uh, from taxpayers mostly to to build. So the question I had was, could we figure out a way to fabricate the equivalent sort of device that does all of that stuff? And then we'd have a means to more quickly iterate on uh, different design concepts to expand the state of the art and also a faster off route, uh, off ramp from a laboratory to an actual practical device. So for example, ACEs and Ambient, would be examples of this kind of, of problem in action. So could you just, once you fabricated this thing, could you just make an, a, a more copies of it more quickly or at least not iterate so much? So that's what we're doing. So you're combining photonics and electro and circuits and other kinds of devices into a quantum sensor and trying to make it all at once and, and see if we could do that. I mean, just imagine how much faster we could go if we could do that instead. So that's, and not to mention, you know, for us in the DOD, if we saw something that was really going to make a big impact to uh, our national security, we could actually do something about that relatively quickly. So that's that's the goal. Right. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. And then there, there's the second program you're rolling out. So tell me a little bit about that. So Quiver is, a, is another magnetometer program. And so this, this, we were just talking about ambient and the idea of trying to make a gradiometer. And so I got to and just before you go, does, does Quiver stand for something? Is Sorry, yes, yes. Quiver stands for the Quantum Imaging of Vector Electromagnetic Radiation. I emphasize vector because that's what the, the key real question is. So these magnetometers that we made in Ambient, uh, they are scalar magnetometers. So for, for the uninitiated, what that means is that the magnetic field of the Earth is a vector. You can see these field line. Uh, if you look at the iron filings around a, like a, like a, a permanent magnet, if you've seen pictures like that, those are showing you the field lines. They kind of curl around on themselves. So it's a little bit of a complex uh, vector uh, field. It's an imagine, it's a sort of an invisible field that's there. And if you try to measure the, the magnitude of that at any point, you're only getting part of the information. So instead, the question is, let's make a vector magnetometer that can measure the three different orthogonal components of that magnetic field vector, X, Y, and Z, say. And then we'll make those into a, a small array uh, and measure the derivatives. And then you can measure something called the Jacobian tensor of the magnetic field, or actually of any field. The Jacobian tensor. The Jacobian tensor. Sorry, it's a mathematical uh, speak here, but it's a matrix, a three by three matrix, where each component of the matrix is a derivative of a vector component with respect to a different directional component. So for example, 
the derivative of the magnetic field in the x direction with respect to a, a, a translation in the y direction would be the middle component, say, of that matrix. Okay, and so what I'm gonna actually have to ask you to do then is, is maybe translate that down into, if you succeed, what's the capability ah, that you're gonna yeah, So deliver? why are we talking about this, right? So the, uh, the, here's the magic of it, right? Once you have that tensor, you now have all of the relevant information about the magnetic field due to, say, a permanent magnet. And with all that information, now this clutter and background field problem is no longer a physics lesson anymore, it's a mathematical lesson. It's a question of what algorithm can I use on that mathematical object to deduce information about the object I'm looking for. And that's very, very powerful because now you've reduced a sensing problem into a computation problem, a very easy computation problem I should really add. A three by three matrix is not very complicated. So with that, we hope we can make a very general magnetometer that could see almost anything we hope to really make a big impact on the ability for magnetometers to uh, be able to find the magnetic field of the objects they're looking for. And so hope, it's a sort of a general problem for every magnetometer. Can you concretize that e either in, you know, sort of military technology space or civil civilian technology space where that's going to make a difference? Let's say you are a, a civilian. We'll just stick with that for the moment. And you're, you, you have a wellhead that maybe you, your company built has been in the ground, you know, it's 50 years old, and you don't know where it is. You know it's in a field, maybe. You know, you've, you've got that far. You've got a map somewhere, and you say, okay, there's, there's the, the wellhead I needed to attach to or to do something with is somewhere in this 100-acre this, this field. That's a very common scenario. A, a pipeline could be a pipeline, something like this. And you say, okay, I want to go find that. It's been covered over vegetation for long ago. Now you have this unfortunate problem, just like the person trying to find the earring on the on the beach, you have to get it, take a magnetometer, to, you're gonna try to find the, you know, it's iron in the pipe, say, so it has a nice magnetic field, but you have to systematically, you know, a few inches over the ground maybe, survey that entire field, trying to find that wellhead. But with, with Quiver, imagine being able to do that if you were just in range. And so instead of having to survey the whole field systematically, and do a big analysis on the whole bunch of measurements, which take, would take days, if not longer, to find. Now you go out to the field, and if you're kind of close, you, you measure your, uh, your magnetic field, and it just tells you, there it is. And you go over there and find it. Now you're done. That's the big meta problem. Could you actually put that on a drone? That's actually, it, it's a good question. That's exactly how they actually do it. They have dropped magnetometers from drones and do the surveying that way. But it's still a very long time in order to do that. John, in an email exchange, you wrote something that really intrigued me. Um, and here's what you wrote. I like to make the point that quantum sensors can observe electric, magnetic, and inertial forces, sort of gravitational forces, more accurately than anything else, at least in, in a laboratory or laboratory scales. And then you said, when you really think about it, this encompasses every part of our world because all of our human experience is governed by these forces. That's amazing to me. I love thinking about, you know, sort of quantum sensors this way. It gives me some sense of why we go about it. But we've also been measuring electrical, magnetic, and inertial forces with, without some of the sensors you have in mind. So what do we gain by building quantum sensors like the ones you're pursuing? It's all about noise and sensitivity, maybe, and accuracy. You know, the original sort of sensors or devices were mechanical. Uh, clocks are just sort of a special case of this way, but that's sort of the oldest, right? A pendulum clock, you see that on the wall, and you know... Kind of, that's not very accurate. It's more of a, of a display piece at this point, right? Why is that? Well, we've replaced that mechanical device with a, an electrical one, an electrical component, right? So you've got a, a quartz maybe oscillator in your wristwatch, and that's, that's way better from an accuracy point of view. Uh, and the same thing's true for, for uh, like, say, a magnetometer. You can make a magnetometer with a permanent magnet on, like, some kind of tension rod and make a mechanical sort of magnetometer, sort of, like a compass, actually, I should have said that first. A compass is a magnetometer, it's a mechanical one. It's very simple. So that's so that's great, but going to electrical systems and finally now to quantum systems, it's really just about improving the accuracy and sensitivity of these kinds of devices. So the why is that? Well, it's, it's simply because that in the quantum world, uh, noise and sort of errors are just the, the, the physical properties that drive those sorts of uh, 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 mechanisms are just a lot smaller. So the, 
and the, their noise properties are amenable to, to making the best devices we know how to make. So in every field, like I said, electric, gravity, and magnetic, we haven't got a, a quantum uh, nuclear force uh, measurement system yet, but I imagine one could make one in the future. But uh, they're all they're all quantum mechanically based because of this this inherent accuracy that's based in the system, and, and it gets kind of a, a long it's a long maybe story about trying to figure out why exactly that is. But that's the fundamental reason is that 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 quantum devices the noise properties are just a, better than electrical or mechanical ones. So you're kind of reiterating something, but feel free to elaborate just briefly. And again, what's so exciting to me about that is one the the, the new technological opportunities that these kinds of sensing uh, devices would allow, but it's also the way it takes away our, what otherwise might be a blindness to certain kinds of phenomena that are out there, but we don't see them because we don't have the, the sensors that are uh, good enough to detect. That's right. I mean, if you, you know, take a little volume in space in your house or, you know, somewhere else, anywhere else in the universe, uh, the fundamental forces are at play in that little volume. You know, there are electric fields there, there are magnetic fields there, there's gravity, uh, there are photons moving through that space uh, that, you know, there isn't light uh, or, or, or radio waves. It's all there. And our eyes are just special versions of this. Your eyeball is a biological sensor measuring optical fields. Uh, it's, a, it's a special case of an electromagnetic field. You know, a lot of animals have magnetometers built into them so they can navigate around the world. Uh, that was, took a long time to figure out that even was possible, but sure enough, it is. So these fundamental forces govern everything. And that, so for our, us to be able to peer behind the curtain, so to speak, to see more and more of what's everywhere, everywhere around us, and understand that and be able to reproduce that so we can all agree of what we're seeing. Uh, that is, I think, the ultimate sort of uh, ability to see the world. Wow, that was great. Fascinating way to think about, you know, moving the state of the art of sensors. So thanks for sharing that. Now, we are running out of time. So I, I do want to ask you one other question, which is, what question do you wish I had asked that I did not ask? And if there is such a question, you should ask it now and answer it. I, I have a question. Here it is. You know, the question is really, why would quantum devices be more accurate? And I, I say accurate because uh, sensitivity and being able to observe the world is really a different question from knowing what you're seeing is truly what the world uh, is, is showing you, like that, that we can all agree on the same thing. And that, that to me is actually even more powerful still. It's easy to maybe imagine making more sensitive devices that could just see more signal or have less noise. But for you and I to be able to agree without having to do anything in advance that our devices see the same thing uh, means that we can also uh, build upon our mutual measurements and, and collaborate more easily. And so that, that's really powerful to have, you know, accurate uh, measurements of the world around us that we can all agree on. And, and so quantum devices are, are, especially good at that. They're more sensitive too, and that's useful, but they're also more accurate. And the reason is because most of these things are based on atoms, not all, but most. And every atom is actually exactly the same. You can't manufacture something to be exactly the same, no matter how hard you try. There's always manufacturing tolerances. But as long as we're using atoms, every single atom is exactly the same. If you have some hydrogen in a tank, it's the exact same hydrogen that I have in my tank. And so we can use that to be a means for agreeing upon our measurements. It's sort of like the ultimate reference by which we can all agree on on what we're seeing and what maybe the numbers from our instruments are telling us. So uh, may you succeed in all of these uh, the, these uh, efforts uh, at DARPA and then beyond that. So I just want to thank you, John, for spending uh, this time with me. Well, that was a lot of fun. I hope it turns into something that uh, people really can kind of learn from and, and uh, see a little bit more about what we're doing here. Thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with us. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. Thanks also to Ben Sullivan and Tom Shortridge for their partnership in producing this program. For more information about Dr. John Burke, the programs he runs in the Microsystems Technology Office, and the other breakthrough technologies DARPA is working on, visit DARPA.mil. And for links that enable you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website.